All right, our next presenter is Iona Jones, and she joins us from the University of uh, Arizona. Iona worked in HAO with Scott Sewell this summer, and her title of her oral presentation is Implementation of Absolute Point of Focus Technology and Solar Image Processing. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Iona. Most of you know me, but yes, I did do some solar imaging this summer, specifically with the Absolute Point of Focus Technology and using the H-Alpha filter. So for some background, the High Alt Altitude Observatory, also known as the HAO, is developing a space-borne tunable bifringent optical filter. This is also known as the LIAT Filter Demonstration Instrument, or the LEFTI project. Um, and my research this summer sought to develop high-quality solar images using an H-alpha filter, which captures around the wavelength of 656 nanometers. Um, by taking photos of the sun at H alpha, we can observe the sun's chromosphere. And the image processing techniques from this summer um, will be used to develop the filter technology and image resolution at the HAO. So why do we do solar imaging? Solar imaging allows for better monitoring of space weather and solar flares. Space weather can cause power outages, it can mess with our GPS, it can mess with FEMA and communication, and also with the health of astronauts in various space stations. Solar images are also used to study the sun's atmosphere and to refine the understanding of solar physics. The better resolution and details in our images, the more that we can understand about these topics. When it comes to the physics of the sun, we're looking for high resolution with specific types of solar phenomena. Some examples, we have solar filaments and prominences. These are the same thing. Prominence is when you see it on the edge of the sun, and a filament is when you see it on the disk. But these are extending features of the sun made of plasma that are held together by magnetic fields. And these can impact space weather and the Earth's magnetosphere. We also have solar flares, which are intense bursts of energy that are caused by the release of magnetic energy that can impact the Earth's upper atmosphere. And then sunspots are darker, cooler regions caused by intense magnetic activity. And these are responsible for various types of solar phenomena. So, like I said, with the H-alpha filter, we are capturing the soul's, soul, sun's chromosphere. This is a thin layer of plasma that's between the photosphere and the corona. It's the second layer of the Earth's atmosphere, and it's kind of a transition area. With H-alpha, we can clearly see filaments, prominences, and then flares, and also blotches, which are kind of white areas. In order to capture these images, we have a very specific set of equipment. We have an 8-inch Schmidt-Cassegram telescope from Botter and then our H-alpha filter that allows us to capture it at the H-alpha wavelength. We also have a camera that will process the images through SharpCap, and then we have an equatorial mount computer system to help us align to Solar North, and we have a hand paddle to allow us to track the sun as it moves through the sky. Once we've obtained our solar images, we have to go through a specific set of solar imaging processing steps. Beginning with the unprocessed image, we then normalize the image, Fat, flat field and subtract dark, colorize the image so that it's yellow like the sun. And then since our camera does not capture the full sun, if we take a photo of every part of the sun, we can stitch it together to get a full picture of what the sun looks like. And then I would apply the absolute point of focus technology for a better image resolution. This is an example of what one of our fully processed images would look like and what our general goal is when we're solar observing. So the first step, like I said, is image normalization. This is a process of adjusting pixel intensity to be within a specified range to improve the contrast of the image. We took only 16-bit images, and to normalize 16-bit images, we would divide each pixel value of the image by 65,535. Um, and for context, this is the range of pixel intensity in a 16-bit image goes from 0 to 65,535. Um, and then for dark subtraction, we have to take dark images. I swear this is a real image I took and not just a black rectangle that I put on the screen. <laughs> um, I cannot prove it, you'll just have to believe me. But if there were any light in this image, it would mean that we'd likely have a leak in our camera, so it's good that it's pure black. Um, in order to take these, just leave the lens cap of the camera on and take the dark image. We, after taking this dark image, we just refer to it as our dark, and we would subtract each pixel value in the dark image from the image that we're trying to correct. This gets rid of the baseline dark current value present in the image, 
though, for the record, though I say it's baseline dark current, dark current is temperature dependent and can increase with increasing temperatures, and that's why we have a cooling system in our filter and in our camera. And then our next step is flat field correction. Flat field correction is designed to eliminate the distortion caused by the optical system, for example, our camera and also our filter. Um, examples of this are vignetting, dust spots, and dust shadows. In order to take a flat field image that we need for our corrections, we would take a diffusive flat surface and cover the lens, and then you have to flood the camera with light. So for us, we pointed our camera at the sun to take our flat field images. So you can dissect this flat image by seeing, like I said, it's a flat surface that we cover the lens with and then flood with light. So these, if it was a perfect image, these dark corners wouldn't be here, and these dark corners are called vignetting, and then we also have our dust spots. And this is what we're trying to correct for in, in our images so that they're more accurate. So I wrote code for normalization, dark subtraction, and flat field correction. And this is the general equation for flat field correction. It's the unprocessed image subtracted by the dark image multiplied by the mean value of the flat subtracted by the dark divided by the individual flat and dark value of each pixel. And we can see on the left that we have an original image of the sun with the dark corners and dust spots. And on the right, those have been corrected out so that we can get a better picture of what the sun actually looks like. And then just as one small note, when I say flat in that equation, I mean a normalized flat field image, which I normalize differently than other images by taking the mean pixel value of the center so that the vignetting does not disrupt the normalization process. And then finally, I apply the absolute point of focus technology. Um, the absolute point of focus is a post-processing de technique that's designed to increase the sharpness of an image without increasing the noise. Noise is random variation in image signal, and Christoph Kalsais, as pictured on the left, developed a Photoshop plugin called APF-R to allow this process to be done through Photoshop. Many other image processing techniques, and specifically black, bar sh black box sharpening techniques, cause an image to look over-processed and to lose the information. With the absolute point of focus technology, um, it separates out objects in the image by finding borders. These borders are areas of high contrast, and by separating them out into separate objects and then Photoshop layers, I can edit them individually instead of editing the image as a whole. This separation step can be repeated with a different radius for that area of contrast, so I can keep pulling out various objects from the image and editing objects of different size or clarity. So for example, um, the border of the sun compared to the back of the sky would be an area of high contrast. And by changing that radius, I could then continue to pull out smaller filaments and sunspots from the disk of the sun to edit them individually. So with the APFR, it is different for every image. It depends on the seeing, um, the atmospheric seeing, and the conditions of our photos, and also what the end goal is for each image and how people want them to look. Um, it can take up to 50 layers to get this to its end result, but the APFR Photoshop plugin definitely makes it easier. Um, after I pull out the objects into all of these layers, I combine them with Gaussian blur layers. Gaussian blur layer uses the Gaussian function to remove the noise in the image mathematically. I have an example of the Gaussian function here and also the Gaussian function graphed, and if you've never heard of it, you've probably heard of the Bell function, which is a Gaussian function. Um, so this is an example of what I do specifically in Photoshop. I can pull out shadows and highlights and edit those individually, and I can scale them from one to seven in sharpness. You can also open up, as you see on the right, a very specific layer and edit that layer individually into its blending style. And then this will be an example of the APFR process at its very simplest, where I would have three separate layers, one with maximum Gaussian blur, one with minimum, and one with a median Gaussian blur. So this is an example of a before and after with the APFR process. Yes, it is subtle, but subtlety is very important in astrophotography and anything that increases the resolution without losing information or increasing noise is really important. You can see the differences more clearly when the image is zoomed in. And you can see here that this filament is a lot lighter and less defined than on the right side where it's more specific and centralized. We also have a sunspot. Um, sunspots have an umbra and penumbra that 
you can see a lot more clearly in the second image. And then some of the areas of the first image look like they might be shading, and then once they are sharpened, you can tell that they're individual filament lines. And then something that is very special about this technology is that not only do the darker parts of the image get darker, but so does this plage, that white area, it gets lighter, um, so the image is not being overexposed. And then this would be a final image adjusted to solar north, um, and that was with a full disk of APFR applied to it. We can also compare these images to the Gong images. Gong is a solar um, observatory that has locations all across the US, the closest one being Big Bear, California. Usually when we compare these, we compare them on the exact same day, and you can see the similar types of solar activity in each of them. This allows us to make sure that when we're stitching these images, um, they're not being altered in any way, and it also allows us to compare our quality, but you can see similar regions of activity and sunspots in each of the images. So this is a photo of me and my partner, Ben, um, outside with our telescope and our little setup. Um, so it was very cool to be able to work with such fun technology this summer. Um, I think our solar image processing work has really improved the solar images that I presented. The resolution is better, and that solar activity that I wanted to capture is more visible. So the HAO will continue developing this code to create a more comprehensive image processing procedure and use these techniques in their development of a spaceborne optical filter. And I just wanted to say my thanks um, to Scott in his mentoring of me and to Dennis in his guidance and help. And also, of course, to Finn for being my companion throughout a lot of this. And also to Ben and Jerry for their help and guidance and this opportunity. So those are my citations. And yeah. Great work, Ayanna. Wonderful presentation. Do we have some questions from the audience? Yep. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if there was any interference with, you know, some of the kind of like atmospheric, um, like greenhouse gases or anything like that, or if there would be any benefit to have a, I don't know, to, to prefer like the photography to be, let's say, in like satellites or space or anything like that. Well, when we're talking about this solar imaging, obviously I don't have access to a satellite, but <laughs> what we were developing here is solar image processing steps from the ground that eventually the HAO is going to turn into a spaceborne filter to capture um, from space. So there will be benefits, and that um, is going to happen after I'm gone. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, that that was a very nice presentation, and you made some really beautiful images. Um, so, two. I'm going to ask two questions, Jerry. Um, so, the two questions. Um, the first one is in a lot of imagery of the of the sun, you see like the solar flares coming off the limb of the the disk of the sun, and um, it, does your algorithm like? Not a comfort. I didn't notice any on your imagery. It could just be the day you were looking. Um, I was just curious about that. So I believe you're referring to those prominences when you can see on the edge of the sun yeah. limbs extending. We took so many photos throughout the course of this summer, and there definitely were photos with those prominences. We looked for them, um, took them, and I specifically edited photos with those prominences and was able to get them a lot more visible. Um, unfortunately, I did not include any of those. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's a great thing to ask about. And they're one of the cooler things to see when we're processing these images and taking them. Yeah, the, the other question is maybe a little more personal in a sense. So, so as you did this work, did you get really, I mean, the, the whole art and science of right image processing is a, a body of work unto its own. So did you find yourself getting really interested in that? Or do you like find yourself asking like, OK, now that we got these cool images, what can we learn about the sun and how it works? Um, well, to those who know me, you know that I am a double major in physics and art, so I would say both parts of that <laughs> were really fascinating to me. Um, but I think the best part was just that I've never done astronomy before. I've never done solar imaging. Um, so I got really into all of it. It was just a great opportunity. Yeah. 
for it. Thank you so much, Iona. Yeah.